Cool. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, so yeah, uh, my name is Asmir. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, I am an engineer at uh, Number Zero, uh, mainly working on the IRO project. Um, yeah, I'm a mostly numbers uh, kind of uh, ops type of guy. Uh, I like to stray from the main path and just do like a lot of different things. And uh, but I try to always come back to the numbers because that's what they ask me for. Um, at number zero, we're building IRO and uh, we're trying to do our own IPFS implementation that kind of closes the gap between Web 2 and Web 3. Um, we were at camp and uh, we then presented some numbers uh, which uh, people found interesting and uh, today I just want to expand to uh, expand on that a little bit and present uh, what we did, how we did it and uh, yeah, maybe we can share some experiences. Uh, yeah, I don't, so I don't know if anybody recognizes this image. Uh, I highly recommend the talk behind this. Um, this came out because I tried to, tried to find an image for a slide and I wanted to do a what, how, why uh, about the presentation. And uh, Wetman is a really funny talk that I like to listen every now and then and uh, have a good laugh. So I highly recommend it. Uh, anyways, the what. Uh, so yeah, I, I like being pragmatic about the stuff I do. and. Uh, so most of my work, uh, incidentally, also has to be pragmatic because we want to move fast and we are a small team and I uh, just keep building and building more and more tools to measure more stuff and produce more numbers. Um, over the past year, uh, there were a lot of things that we built and uh, I just want to show them and uh, maybe present the impact it had on uh, our work, how it shaped the course, uh, course of our work and uh, make that small summary and uh, there's still some takeaways, some learnings, uh, gotchas, I don't know, painful moments, uh, something like that. So yeah, uh, the how. Uh, I'll explain these images. Uh, this is uh, an old kind of computer or server that I had laying around the floor. Uh, now it's cleaned up and uh, this is where our infrastructure for metrics lived for quite a while actually. Uh, I now moved it into a nicer cabinet but uh, it's still the same stuff. Uh, I got a lot of more gear that's on my table that isn't in the rack, which it should be. Uh, anyway, so we started about a year ago. Uh, we, would know, we knew we wanted to do numbers from the start and uh, just like optimize bit by bit and do like very focused uh, precision level like adjustments to what we do. Uh, we wanted to do smaller pieces instead of like the full blown IPFS implementation. We wanted to take out the individual bits and then do them one by one. and. Uh, slowly iterate on those instead of trying to like do the whole balloon because there's, there's a lot of stuff to do. Um, so the hard part for me is this was basically the dark mm -hmm. metrics ages uh, at number zero because we had no infrastructure, we had no code, no dashboards, no nothing, except there were like furious engineers trying to produce as much code as possible and they wanted numbers yesterday. Um, so yeah, I had to survive that. And uh, the why for the presentation, uh, I don't really have a super strong reason. It's just that I like to share engineering banter and uh, just share and learn from uh, everybody's experiences. And I hope to do the same for you to hear. Uh, q and is formally at the end, but uh, you can grill me on the spot. Like this is meant to be very casual and uh, you can just like raise your hand and ask questions throughout the presentation. Cool. Uh, so the timeline, uh, I used DALI to generate this image. It's uh, a capybara traveling through time from the Big Bang. Uh, no strong explanation. Uh, I just don't know why it has wheels. I, I apparently you need wheels to travel through time. So yeah, let, let's go to the timeline and uh, I'll just like start showing. Uh, so commit number nine was uh, implementing metrics. Uh, I really had to rush this one and uh, just to show some numbers and so we can start iterating. Um, it was fairly simple, like this was collect simple counters. Uh, I don't know, numbers of requests, uh, bytes served, bytes received, uh, I don't know, just to get something going. And uh, it was exposed as a single Prometheus endpoint uh, like most people start out. Uh, obviously that's a little bit hard to consume for them so I had to build more. Um, yeah, um, those that are interested uh, in the Rust specifics, uh, I started with Tokyo's metrics uh, crate and uh, it was nice, but uh, the whole community otherwise was using uh, Prometheus client and uh, different tooling. So uh, 
for compa compatibility reasons with uh, lib P2P specifically, because we wanted to dive deep into that, uh, I shifted the library that we use uh, underneath. Uh, it also allowed me to hack a little bit more, so we did more things uh, to make it easier for us. Um, yeah, the second bit that I had to do is just prop up some infrastructure, and uh, you saw the box that uh, hosted our infrastructure for uh, quite a while. Um, I wanted to avoid lock-in uh, because we didn't really know what tooling we were going to use and uh, how far we would need to scale or not scale, and uh, we just wanted to be fluid as possible with that. Um, so I basically took a very simple Prometheus stack. Uh, I took timescale DB, uh, which is basically Postgres with uh, sent weeks uh, to get the counter data in. And uh, what I did to kind of like help the devs out a little bit is uh, convert all their code to kind of like be pushing data out to a push gateway instead of like uh, scraping as you usually do with uh, Prometheus. Um, this had some bad, uh, well, not bad, but uh, it has some properties like uh, the push gateway continue, continually keeps the last value that, sent, that you sent it, and uh, if a node dies or uh, otherwise doesn't report any more data, uh, unless you scrub your push gateways regularly, uh, it just reports the last values ever seen. And uh, if it drops off, you don't know that it dropped off because you see like a constant line, and if you don't monitor closely, you lose track of it. Um, and I set up a group of fan a dashboard so we can just see that that was our portal into, into metrics. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, so uh, the first tool that I built just to keep things going is uh, a small pinger utility. Uh, it basically hit a few well-known endpoints that we had set up uh, on our deployments just so that it would tra generate traffic and people could see their own like thing working, doing something, because otherwise the only method of testing was somebody had to manually go and like try to fetch stuff or see stuff and uh, just makes our lives easier. It wasn't really a super helpful tool, it just like kept things going and uh, it was useful in the first days just to see if like everything got broken down or stuck or whatever. So moving on from there, uh, this was actually our first proper tool that actually brought a lot of insights uh, into our work. Um, Back at camp, uh, Thibault from uh, Cloudflare actually presented a very similar tool, uh, which was also similarly named. And uh, I was really glad to hear about that because uh, that meant uh, whatever I built here wasn't really a totally off idea. It, it had some sense to it and uh, was useful beyond our own wall garden. Um, so what, what I did here is uh, we deployed across a number, number of regions and uh, we wanted to build a few test cases to, be, to have a playground where we could do apples to apples comparisons to other implementations. Um, the easiest ways for us to do is uh, just use gateways as like an entry platform for all and uh, have a tool that uh, kind of hammers those with specific requests and uh, test cases. Um, I had a few boxes that would spin up uh, random data and uh, push them to the network uh, and uh, see how fast they would resolve, what's the latency, time to first byte, time to, I don't know, uh, download the whole thing. Uh, there were cases where you would do a re repeat qu request so you can test the caching properties that it had and, uh, and so on. Um, this turned out to be really good because uh, I deployed it about the time we had our first working version of Iro at that point, or at least we thought we had that with it. Um, the first numbers that came in, uh, they were horrible for us. Uh, we were doing like, I don't know, five, 10, 15% of like all resolutions at all, not, not looking at the numbers uh, of the time or latency it took uh, to do things. Um, this actually motivated the whole team like, to go all hands on deck and just see what the hell was wrong with it. Uh, so. At that specific time, we were just starting out with our BitSwap implementation, and uh, BitSwap is a finicky thing. The spec is super light, and uh, it seems super easy to do. Uh, in reality, it's probably the hardest thing you'll have to implement uh, regarding the whole IPFS network thing, at least initially. Um, we had a lot of trouble like uh, seeing why it didn't work. Like You can see that it doesn't work, but it's really hard because, uh, again, superficially, it's very easy. Um, and then we started digging into it to uh, see. So 
we had to backtrack a couple of times and uh, we went and compared against Kubo and uh, its implementation, what it did, and uh, obviously had a lot more implemented at that point. So we started to backtrack and just keep adding more and more of the surrounding stuff to BitSwap until it started kind of working. Um, we did a lot of refinements and we got up to par with uh, the rest of the gateways and uh, eventually we managed to be like the top three uh, in terms of like numbers, uh, ability to resolve and everything else. So things were rosy, we were really happy. Uh, this was a, uh, maybe like a month or two before we had to go to camp. Uh, remember the rosy moment because it wasn't, it wasn't that rosy. Uh, so this is the second tool that came in. Uh, it, it, it came in about halfway when we were working through the gateway checker stuff uh, that we discovered. Um, it, internally, we called it the test stream, uh, but uh, basically George uh, from PL was uh, kind enough to hook us with a substream of the gateway requests uh, on a certain region uh, and uh, basically forward us the requests as, as they came in uh, so we can do some real world testing in, in the whole thing. And uh, I basically took that stream, uh, made a simple utility that would uh, replicate the requests uh, across a number of machines that we had standing. Um, I compared to like uh, IRO uh, from the main branch, IRO uh, from a dev box that we used to con continuously test uh, Kubo for a couple of versions and uh, we basically just like iterated on those. Uh, the first thing that popped out to us is we were back at num like the the beginning because our numbers sucked again. Uh, turns out the real world is very different from like artificially set up tests and uh, it's really hard to try and predict what you're going to encounter uh, on the real network versus like whatever you have uh, locally set up. Like not a few machines here and there and you try to transfer data that usually works uh, out kind of well. Uh, but if you start like joining the actual network and uh, serving actual data over the gateways, uh, it's gonna be hard. Um, it took us quite some time and uh, a huge effort from the whole team to start figuring out all the issues. We had issues with uh, Unix FS pathing and we had issues with uh, consuming data from uh, all the different NF uh, NFTs that were like being served. Uh, I think they didn't provide their records to the net network or you only had the root uh, provided. So we had to like work on actually like fetching the data out. Uh, and we slowly built that stuff up. And uh, we came to solid numbers um, on the whole thing. Uh, and again, we built it up, I'm, we're gonna draw back again. Um, but it was one of the tools that uh, actually showed us uh, the value of like continuously like testing and uh, testing with real stuff. Uh, along the, in the same time, we were doing a lot of benchmarking, like uh, benchmarking the ad performance, get performance, uh, and so on. And uh, the camp numbers that we showed and uh, numbers that we might share uh, here, uh, in some we are better than Kubo, in some we are worse than Kubo, and I can pretty certainly say that those numbers don't always reflect the reality. Like uh, Kubo beat us out functionally on a lot of things even though we had better numbers on like raw add and get performance. Uh, we managed to like get back on our feet and actually do a pretty good job on resolving stuff and doing stuff, uh, but uh, Real world testing like is king uh, until you put it like testing production, basically. There's no substitute for that. You'll, you'll have to burn yourself on that. Uh, and uh, the performance benchmarking we did, uh, there was a lot of fun with that. Uh, I initially took a cloud box and we basically ran the code side by side and uh, different tests and you get some numbers. Uh, if you repeat the same test throughout the day, 10 times, you'll get different numbers, not a little bit different, different wildly different numbers. Uh, so what happens? Uh, well, it turns out cloud providers uh, have virtualized and abstracted so many layers that you never really know where it runs on what it runs or uh, how well it will run. Uh, the first issue for us was uh, disk speed was very inconsistent on cloud providers. So we used a provisioned IO machine or whatever. Uh, which was nicer, but it still wasn't really that consistent because sometimes you get a slightly faster machine for whatever reason, like even the same configurations of machines never really perform the same uh, across our testing. Uh, same kernel, same like system, everything else. Uh, so 
what we decided to do is build our own boxes. Like, uh, you can't really substitute, like, having your own hardware, a controlled environment, fixed dependencies, everything else, and then just running your stuff to test against. Uh, so I highly recommend whoever is doing any kind of sort of benchmarking, unless it's a fleeting benchmark locally to see relative to yourself how you're doing today. Uh, if you want concrete numbers over time, fixed boxes, dedicated boxes. Um, yeah, uh, during this time, we had a lot of issues. Uh, we discovered that uh, even when everything was rosy and things were working, uh, after three days, seven days, 15 days, uh, things would lock up. And uh, we were having uh, abnormally large like download or upload numbers, and uh, it was odd. Uh, it took us time to figure out things that were happening under her hood. Uh, one of the issues we actually never really resolved because we just decided to move on from that and uh, do a different thing. Um, but uh, we had to instrument everything. Like logs didn't really help because there was so much volume of data and everything else coming through that you couldn't really like humanly filter it to a sensible amount. Like even if you filter it down to a set of logs, uh, you don't really understand them if you look at them uh, that way. Uh, so metrics. Just numbers, more numbers, and uh, just aggregate more and more numbers until you start making sense of it. Uh, for our BitSwap implementation, we literally uh, instrumented every for loop, every if, every uh, event that was sent out, everything uh, to get a little bit more sense. So we had a lot of run loops uh, and uh, a lot of like branching predictors and a lot of uh, counters for events and just trying to connect like when, when this event happens, what happens there? And uh, it's terribly hard because it's a very soft system and you're talking to a number of nodes. Uh, so we decided eventually to kind of like try to isolate that uh, out and test out some things. Uh, I'll touch on the test round a little bit later. Um, but uh, yeah, we had a lot of trouble in this uh, period, uh, but uh, it helped us a lot and uh, got us ready for camp and uh, we actually managed to deliver a functioning product at that time, which had good perf characteristics, and uh, we moved on. Uh, we used this tool later, and uh, it actually helped us to get to the point where we were saying we were going to do something else, and uh, basically it was like changing tides. Uh, we decided at IRO to just go back to zero and revisit all the little bits that we were doing and just take control of our full stack and uh, build it from the ground up. Uh, Test stream showed like after, after all the like different fixes and improvements and uh, optimizations, uh, we were having decent results, but eventually st things started breaking or uh, for some certain use cases, we were having suboptimal results, even though we should be having pro probably good results. Uh, one of the things that really put us off was uh, we find out that uh, Rust lib P2P and Go lib P2P, even though they should talk together perfectly, uh, they don't, and uh, it was really hard to maintain connections between Rust and Go clients, and uh, that essentially meant we were kind of cut off from the public network in, in a real sense. Like, sometimes it worked, but usually it didn't, and uh, that's when we knew like, we had to take control of our own stack and just like, start doing really, really like, iterative design on very small bits. Anyways, uh, our priorities changed uh, in terms of like, where we want to put effort in, and uh, I had to build more tooling. So uh, I built a new repo, it's called Chuck. Uh, and the reason it's called Chuck is because I just chuck stuff in there. It's a lot of like stuff to where I have to like play around, a little bits of scripts to help me out uh, and do stuff. Uh, the priority itself, uh, the repository itself is really not that uh, uh, important uh, by itself, but it was the birthplace of Netsim. And uh, Netsim is basically our home brewed, brewed uh, version of TestGround. Uh, we did a couple of runs with TestGround, those are uh, unfamiliar. It's a way to simulate like uh, a larger set of like network connected machines and uh, just let them play out uh, with a little bit of coordination and metrics collection added onto it. Um, it was a little bit heavyweight for our use case. Uh, we didn't really need Dockerize or uh, Kubernetes uh, environments uh, spinning up thousands of nodes and so on. We wanted to test connectivity, like two machines was initially enough for us and maybe five later, just to make sure like the basics work uh, and then we can talk about like measuring the whole network. Uh, by the way, thank you ProBlab for like, those are good numbers to have like. Um, 
So we decided to do our own. Uh, and uh, NetSim is a small tool based on like Linux namespaces. It uses uh, Stanford's Mininet to kind of like prop up the network uh, locally. And uh, it allows you to set up a number of nodes with uh, isolated spaces to run processes. And uh, then you just let it play out. Uh, it's way less overhead. Uh, we didn't, uh, we could like really quickly iterate on it. Like our dev loop on test ground was fairly slow. Like building continuously uh, takes time and we wanted to move fast. So this was a lot easier. Also, we didn't really need all the bells and whistles and coordination that uh, test ground provided. So uh, this was very easy to just like keep spamming more and more different like test cases, scenarios, and uh, actually get fairly raw performance out of the box that we were testing on uh, in general. Uh, it was also running on a dedicated test box. And uh, what we wanted to use it is to measure it against uh, Web2 technology, because that's what, where we're trying to go. Uh, Kuba is great functionally to test against, but it's not our performance-like benchmark. We wanted to get to like performance numbers that are in the Web2 realm uh, to make it useful and palatable to people, like regular folks. Um, so I built a small tool uh, that uh, small web server that uh, serves content and we fetch it uh, via curl uh, on the other end. Uh, the reason I did this is uh, I wanted to make it apples to apples. And uh, whenever I say apples to apples, it means there's a lot of bias in the decision making process and uh, bias is inherent to all these uh, measurements. Uh, like whenever we do measurements, I know they're gonna be biased one way or the other. Uh, I think it's important to be just aware of them and make sure it's, uh, it's a fair comparison because you can optimize uh, web servers and curl responses and everything else uh, for your whole life and uh, try to eke out more performance. And optimizing Web2 was not really our play. We were in the like IPFS space. Um, so I just wanted to be, give it a fair playground uh, to test against. The end result of that is uh, that uh, we decided to own our own, own metrics and uh, basically go public with numbers. Uh, it, there's a very small subset uh, of the numbers live at perv.iro.computer. Uh, on camp, we promised we we're gonna like, keep doing numbers, numbers, numbers because people like that. And uh, now we're just gonna like, put them out there so people can do and incrementally see what we did uh, by each commit and by each day. Uh, uh, how stuff performed, and if it falls, we own it, and uh, we figure out why it f fell. Uh, if it grows, that great, um, even better. Uh, so yeah, you can follow along numbers uh, that we now have up there, and uh, yeah, I took heavy inspiration from uh, perf.rustlang, because they also have their own counters, and like on bad days it's bad, on good days it's great. Uh, so you can follow along. Um, besides this, I recommend having like, uh, discourse place uh, where you can chat with other people and uh, just have them chime in. Uh, we have a perf channel on our Discord uh, that uh, some people have joined. And uh, it's been really useful to have like people from a completely different place just come in and see something and just drop you a line or a hint or something. And uh, it really helps out like getting a different perspective on things we were doing. And uh, it's really helped us through us throughout the whole uh, iterative process that we had. So I uh, fully recommend having uh, a place to talk with people. Uh, yeah, that's for the most part it. Uh, do you, here are the takeaways that I kind of like to have for myself here, but uh, hope you take some too. Uh, it's basically make sure that stuff people build is continuously benchmarked because if you don't really test and benchmark it, people let it slip and slide somewhere else. Uh, biases are, always present in whatever numbers you give there. Uh, if you're on cloud, you're obviously biased towards some sort of like configuration. If you're uh, locally, then uh, maybe my own box ded dedicated to testing is flawed because it's, it's one platform and the other platform performs very differently for, uh, for the same code base or whatever. Uh, it's really hard to cut out all the biases, but uh, if you do have them, try to be aware and just like uh, adjust for them and uh, make sure that it's fair. So if you're testing against something, uh, make sure you try to like even the playground. Uh, yeah, test against real stuff. Uh, synthetic, bench synthetic benchmarks lie a lot. Uh, so perf numbers, so whenever you generate them, like micro benchmarking, that's good for your day-to-day -day development. Uh, but uh, on the grand scale of like things working or performing well, uh, production testing. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, use dedicated hardware. Uh, more metrics are greater for development. Uh, they're not necessarily the best tool in the world for better decision making. I tend to distill metrics to a small number of those that we deem important, like top level performance indicators or whatever to like kind of steer a ship. But uh, day to day, more metrics better always. And uh, if you can do one thing, like automate everything and make it repeatable, because only then you can like uh, iteratively test on something. If it's not repeatable, uh, that test is like a one-off, just like curiosity. Uh, yeah, that's about it. Uh, here's a big thank you on the screen. And uh, if there's questions or anything, I'm happy to answer. Other than that, uh, here's my some contact info, how you can reach out, and uh, yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. It seemed like a big. It seemed. Oh, thank you. It seemed like a big fork in the road was trying to replicate behavior seeing in Kubo that didn't match, I guess, a spec or like a lightly specified. Yes. Yeah. That, that was can a you, very big part. Can you dig into like what you were working from and then how that went? Uh, sure. So uh, I'll touch in two bits. Uh, one was, uh, per because personally I was working on doing the first pass on uh, our own gateway, and the second one was uh, doing uh, the whole team did bit swap. Uh, bit swaps uh, spec is fairly concise and uh, very idealistic. Uh, Turns out that as soon as you like want to be part of the network, uh, it's not that it's not part of the spec. It's just that the spec says what it has to do, but it, the spec doesn't tell you like what everybody else is going to be doing uh, on the network. So uh, sending out requests and receiving responses, that's great. But uh, once you start adding more nodes, people figured out that uh, that was overwhelming them. So they started like limiting how much messages you send, you send out or receive back. Uh, there's issues because once you want to receive all the bit swap messages, you have to parse them. You don't really know the, con net, the contents of it or who sent it or why, and then you have to like go through them, analyze them, see if you want to read them or discard them or whatever, uh, which introduces a lot of like volume issues. You start getting a lot of data in, uh, whether you like it or not. Um, so people start rate limiting stuff around. We did our we did on our end too, and uh, there were things like. Uh, where, oh, just a moment. What were the, there were more issues, so. Out of spec. Uh, I can't remember specific uh, details. Uh, can I get back to you? Uh, just, just ping me. Like there was, there was a lot. Like I can just share you a whole dump of the discussions on that. Uh, it, again, uh, the business spec is not the issue that it was out of spec, like the implementation versus the spec. It's that the spec is very simple and covers very little, but the real world is uh, very different in terms of like uh, what you get. Uh, eventually you want like a lot of state management in there. Uh, you want to remember which peer streamed what uh, so you can optimize. Uh, uh, you have to manage the number of peers because otherwise you get overloaded and uh, there's a lot of little funky things that you have to do to maintain stable bit swap like discussions with other nodes uh, without uh, just like nuking your own uh, machine, uh, even though it's by spec. Uh, the gateway was a little bit different story. Uh, when I started writing it, there was no spec, but uh, fortunately, just around the time where I've written mine, uh, by copying some of the Kubo stuff over to Rust, uh, the spec came out and I was fortunate enough to be very close to the spec and it helped me iron out the like la last bit. So, I think the gateways so far are quite up to spec, for example, on, uh, compared to everything else. Uh, yeah, hope, hope it helped a little bit. Uh, but ping, feel free to catch me around later and uh, we can chat more about it. Anybody else? Cool. Uh, I have a quick question yeah. on the, um, uh, the dashboard that you were showing. Uh, 
That's fine. What are, um, what are the numbers? Like it's gigabits per second, one to one, one to 10. Oh, yeah. Are these so, just network node numbers or is yeah. it? Yeah, this is okay. Uh, just basically the setup between how nodes are talking. Like uh, we intentionally have a couple nodes fetching data and a couple nodes providing data. So yeah. one node providing to one Node. One node providing to ten clients. Ah, okay. Yeah. So it's not node numbers as in node one to node ten. No, no, it's no, no. one yeah. to ten. Yeah, to a multiple. Yeah. Right. Okay. And, and it's the same everywhere. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, so this is a very simple snapshot. Uh, I'm going to expand on these numbers uh, quite a bit over the next uh, few weeks or quarter or whatever. Okay. And and the latency are uh, like uh, link like latencies. Latencies uh, and uh, loss numbers to like between the cross links. Serving and those receiving. Okay. So uh, you can simulate like different environments. Uh, this is just for like comparison's sake to see the impact. Uh, they don't really serve a super high purpose right now. Uh, but we want intend to model some specific real world use cases that we know about uh, in terms of like uh, user perceived uh, latency numbers yeah. or loss numbers and uh, basically try to replicate or emulate such networks which are a lot more complex than like just doing one to one transfers with a little bit of latency. Right, okay. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Really quick question. Um, what was the reason to have like locally dedicated hardware as com like in comparison to just... Oh, uh, you can rent boxes, uh, like dedicated boxes. Uh, we do some boxes on Hetzner too and uh, just run numbers. But uh, if you want to benchmark stuff, you need to use uh, dedicated hardware, not virtualized hardware. Gotcha. Okay, and uh, if there are no more questions, then uh, yeah, let's thank the speaker again. And uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, carry on with uh, Guillaume. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>